the first thing we need to know is what is the difference between eukaryotic and a prokaryotic cell? Now, prokaryotic cell is a bacteria and eukaryotic cells are plants and animals. Now, if you see in this diagram, there is a eukaryotic cell and a prokaryotic cell. The first basic difference between the two is the presence of this structure called the nucleus. So nucleus is present in a eukaryotic cell, but in a prokaryotic cell, the nucleus is absent. Apart from the nucleus, eukaryotic cell, you can see they have those organelles which have membrane around them. So all membrane-bound organelles are present in a eukaryotic example, mitochondria, but these membrane-bound organelles are absent from a prokaryotic cell. The next difference is, since the nucleus is absent, in the eukaryotic cell, the DNA is enclosed in the nucleus, but in a prokaryotic cell, it lies naked in the light cytoplasm as it has no nucleus. The eukaryotic cell are mostly multicellular, but the prokaryotic cell are mostly unicellular. The eukaryotic cell DNA is linear, but prokaryotic cell DNA is circular. Both eukaryotic and prokaryotic cell has ribosomes, but in a eukaryotic cell, the ribosomes are big. In a prokaryotic cell, they are small. Eukaryotic cells are multicellular big cells, whereas prokaryotic cells are small unicellular cells. Example is a plant cell and an animal cell of a eukaryote, and for a prokaryote, there's a bacterial cell. So I hope you're able to write these differences because in the exam, they can ask you to list, you know, any two differences or any two similarities between a eukaryotic cell and prokaryotic cell. So make sure you understand these points. Next is, let us look at in detail the structure of an animal cell. Now, the diagram here shows you the animal cell and you can see there's a round big nucleus. The jelly-like fluid that fills the cell is the cytoplasm. The outer layer that surrounds the cell is the cell membrane. And then in these uh, structures on them and freely you have ribosomes and then you have these pink structures called the mitochondria. Now you should know these names and the functions of each as these are found both in plants and an animal cell. So the first is the nucleus. It is the brain of the cell because it controls all the activities. It controls what is happening inside the cell and it also has your genetic information as it contains the dna so you should know all these three functions of the nucleus next is the ribosomes ribosomes are the site for protein synthesis now the cell needs proteins for its functioning and you know enzymes are also protein so ribosomes they make proteins and the enzymes which are required by the cell Next is the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is like the jelly-like fluid which fills the entire cavity of the cell. It is very important part because it has all the enzymes for the chemical reactions of the cell. So majority of the chemical reactions of the cell takes place in cytoplasm. Next is the cell membrane as it's the outer layer. So as it's the outer layer, it is controlling what is going in and out of the cell. And mitochondria is very important. It is a powerhouse of the cell. Powerhouse means it provides the cell with the energy as it is the site where aerobic respiration takes place. Okay, so I hope you know the function of each of these organelles. Okay, and you should be able to label them if any cell is given to you. You should be able to spot where's the nucleus, where's the cell membrane, where's the mitochondria. Next is a plant cell. Now the plant cell has all these organelles which we have just discussed in the previous slide except it has three extra organelles which are just found in a plant cell. They, this is a big large permanent vacuole. These green structures called the chloroplast and outside the cell membrane there's an extra layer called the cell wall. Now, the permanent vacuole, you should remember the function of each one of them. The permanent vacuole is filled with the cell sap and it gives rigidity to the cell and makes the cell turgid. The cell wall is the outer layer and it is made up of cellulose. You should remember the cell wall of the plant cell is cellulosic. It is a layer outside the cell membrane and it supports the plant and maintains its shape. The chloroplast is the site of photosynthesis because it contains a green pigment called chlorophyll, which absorbs sunlight and converts it, converts the light energy into chemical energy, making food. Okay, so you should know the difference between an animal cell and a plant cell. So this is a table that summarizes a difference in both plants uh, and similarities. So in the exam, they can ask you to, you know, give two similarities or two differences. So you should know both similarities and differences in both of these cells. So both are eukaryotic. 
the nucleus is present in both of them cell membrane is present in both of them mitochondria is also present in both of them ribosome is also present in both of them and cytoplasm is also present in both of them but cell wall vacuole and chloroplast is present only in the plant cells so it is absent in an animal cell and it is present in an animal in a plant cell okay so this difference is very very important next is the bacterial cell you should know a typical prokaryotic cell which is a bacterial cell make sure you can label it so you can see this tail like structure which is the flagellum which helps the bacteria to move then it has a cell wall and the cell membrane but the cell wall is not made up of cellulose you have to remember here it is made up of peptidoglycan then outside the cell wall you see a slimy layer which is a capsule and this capsule protects the bacteria and you also see some hair like structures outside this uh, cell wall these appendages helps the bacteria to uh, reproduce okay then since it has no nucleus the dna is circular and it is found naked in the cytoplasm and it has some extra chromosomal material you can see here they have plasmid now plasmids are the extra chromosomal materials which are found in the bacteria so you can see these extra stretches of dna these are plasmid and they are in the form of small rings and they give special properties to bacteria like antibiotic resistance okay so i hope these all organelles this labeling and their functions are clear to you okay so now this is uh, similarities in the differences between the bacteria plant and an animal cell bacteria is prokaryotic plant and animals are eukaryotic the nucleus is absent in bacteria but present in both plants and animal cell cell wall is present in bacteria but non cellulosic remember in a plant cell it is cellulosic in animal cell it is completely absent cell membrane is present in all in bacteria ribosomes are smaller but in plant and animal cell they are bigger DNA is a circular in bacteria but linear in plant and animal cell the genetic material in bacteria is naked found in the cytoplasm in plant it is in the nucleus inside the chromosome and same in animals the chloroplast are absent in the bacteria but they are present in the plant and animal cell and the vacuoles are small in bacteria but in the plant and animal cell they are absent in the animal cell but present in the plant cell Okay so i hope the similarities between bacteria plant and animal cell and the differences they are clear to you okay so next uh, in your syllabus there's a topic on order of magnitude now what is order of magnitude they'll give you the size of the two cells and then they'll ask you what is the order of magnitude of the two cells so what you need to do is you need to divide the size of the two cells okay and that will give you an order of the magnitude so for example if one cell is let's say uh, the 10 meter and the other cell is let's say 100 meters right so you divide the two size so you will get the answer as 10 so it means that one cell is in the order of magnitude 10 than the other okay so for that it is very important the units are same so in the exam they can give you one in meters another in nanometer one is in micrometer another in millimeter so you should remember this conversion so this conversion is simple it comes as a chart killing metal milo mickey nano pictures okay so killing metal milo mickey nano pictures it's kilometers meters millimeters micrometers nanometers and picometers and all are at the level of 10 to the power 3 so kilometers to meters times by 1000 times by 1000 times by 1000 and when you go reverse you need to divide by 1000 so for example if you need to convert the nanometer into meter so you are going from here to here so you will divide it by 10 to the power 9 okay so 1 nanometer is 1 times 10 power minus 9 meters so you can remember this table and this is a mnemonic to remember it so if it is 10 nanometer to meter so from nanometer to meter what do you do you divide it by 10 to the power 9 so that becomes 10 by minus 8 meters and micrometers to meters so micrometers to meters is 1 to 2 bumps so it means divide by 10 to the power 6 so that gives the answer 10 to the power minus 5 meters so it's very important you know how you need to convert make sure both the units are same and then divide the two okay now the next thing we need to do is what are the specialized animal cells now what are specialized animal cells now specialized animal cells are those cells which have some extra features that allow them to perform the specific functions okay now 
What do you need to do for each of these cell type? You need to know what are the functions of each of these cell type. And depending on the functions, what structural characteristics they have. So for example, a nerve cell. What is the function of the nerve cell? To send electrical impulses around the body. Now this is the structure of the nerve cell. And in this nerve cell, what we have is that the nerve cells have dendrite. Now, what is this dendrite? These dendrites are the hair-like structures that receives the impulses. Then it has a long stalk called the axon. This axon transmits the nerve impulses. And at the end, you have the synapse. Now, what is a synapse? They transmit the nerve impulses from one neuron to another. So the structure goes like this. It has a nucleus hair-like structure and a long stalk and at the end it has the synapse. Next is the muscle cell. The function of the muscle cell is to contract and bring about the movement of different parts of the body and for that they are made up of the special fibers which helps them to contract and relax. They contain special proteins that allow them to contract and relax. They have loads of mitochondria which provides them energy to contract and they have special storage carbohydrates called glycogen which acts as a fuel for the muscles. Okay, so for both of them, you should know what is the function and what features do they have. Next is the sperm cell. Now, if you look at the sperm cell, it looks like this. At the top, there's a head which has an acrosome. And this acrosome contains hydrolytic enzyme, which breaks the egg cell wall and penetrate inside the neck inside the egg to fuse with the egg nucleus. The middle piece has mitochondria. The mitochondria provides the energy to swim. The nucleus contains the genetic information and the flagella is a tail-like structure which helps it to swim to large distances. So I hope this function, and you should be able to label this like what is an acrosome with its function, okay? The flagella with its function. So you should know the different components of a cell along with their functions. Okay, so now as we have finished the specialized animal cell, in the same way we have the specialized plant cell. Now what are the specialized plant cell? Again, these are those cells which have some extra features that allows them to perform special functions. Now again, to write about these, you should first know their function. So root hair cells is a cell which act as an exchange surface and absorb water and minerals. Now for the absorption of water and minerals, it needs a large surface area. So the root hairs are the extensions which provides a large surface area for the absorption of water and minerals. Then it has a large permanent vacuole which supports the cell and speeds the movement of water by osmosis. At times, it's not just the diffusion through which the water and minerals move. Uh, the active transport also happens. So for that, there's a mitochondria inside the root hair cell, which provides the energy for active transport. It has a cell wall and it is just one cell thick so that the substances can easily diffuse and the diffusion pathway is reduced. On the other hand, there's a xylem cell. What is the function of the xylem cell? It transports water and minerals from roots to all parts of the plant. Now, since it has to uh, travel water to large distances, it has to form a long continuous column. Now, the cells of the xylems are dead so that they can form a long continuous column which can transport water to large distance. And then inside, you can see the lignin deposit. The lignin deposit makes it waterproof and makes the xylem uh, column strong and strengthen the xylem vessel. The phloem cell is again a transporting tissue but its function is to transport food from the leaf to all parts of the plant now the phloem has lost majority of the cell content so that it can have more room for the food the cells at the periphery uh, so it is in the form of the sieve tube and the cells which are at the end of the sieve tube they are broken to form a sieve plate so that the food can easily percolate okay and since the sieve tubes have lost majority of their cell contents they are supported by a special cell called the companion cell it supports the phloem cell and provides the cell whatever they need especially they are rich in mitochondria which makes a lot of energy for the sieve plates and sieve tubes so that they can transport food the last is the photosynthetic cell the function of the photosynthetic cell is to prepare food by photosynthesis. So it has a large vacuole which helps in the movement of water by osmosis. It is 
having loads of chloroplasts that helps it to trap light for photosynthesis. Also, these cells lie flat onto the leaf surface near to that so that they can easily absorb water, carbon dioxide for quick photosynthesis. Okay, so I hope these special plants and animal cells are clear to you. Now the question comes in, the cells we cannot see by the naked eye. So we take the help of the microscopes. So microscopes are the devices that use to see the cells which we cannot see by our naked eye. And there are two properties of the microscopes which are important and you should know the definition of them. First is the magnification. Magnification is a property of the microscope to enlarge the object and resolution is a property of the microscope to distinguish between two closely placed objects. Now, magnification is calculated by the emit size over an object size. Now, this is an important question. In the exam, they can give you an emit size and they can ask you to find the object size if the magnification is given or the emit size and object size is given to you and ask you the magnification. Or to make it a little complicated, they can give you a cell and they can say that this diameter is 2 micrometer in reality, calculate the magnification. So in that case, what you'll do, you'll take your ruler, measure this actual length, that will be the emit size. The object size, they have already given you 2 micrometer. Make sure you make the unit same by the chart that I have just discussed. I'll just put it again. And then you find the magnification by doing the emit size over the object size. Okay. So... Uh, the table that is given uh, before helps you to convert the different units into a single unit. And remember, for the magnification, both emit size and object size should be of the same unit because magnification is the ratio. Okay, so now there are two types of microscopes. First, we had the light microscopes. These are the microscopes which you see in your school laboratory. Um, they are easy to handle, small and compact, does not require much expertise to handle, and they just have either a mirror at the bottom or a bulb as it uses the beam of light to focus on the object. Whereas electron microscope, it is not easy to handle. It is big and non-portable, requires proper training. It uses beam of electron to focus on the object. Okay. Now, when we use a light microscope, we cannot see the greater subcellular details because the light microscope has a very low resolving and the magnifying power. The resolving power is 0.2 micrometer and magnifying power is just between 1000 to 1500. Whereas for electron microscope, it has a greater resolving power around 0.5 nanometer and the magnifying power is around 100,000 times. So it is the electron microscope that have enabled us to see a proper subcellular structures like mitochondria, ribosomes, and chloroplasts. But for the li uh, light microscopes, you can view the live samples and you do not require special preparations of the samples. But for the electron microscopes, the samples have to be done, have to be dead, and we require some special sample preparations. Light microscope, we can just see the color images. We can stain the sample and see the color images. Whereas electron microscope, it can form 2D and 3D, but the images are black and white. Okay, so I hope this difference between the light microscope and the electron microscope is crystal clear to you. Okay, so make sure you can write the similarities and the differences between the two. Okay, so now you should be able to know the difference between a plant cell and an animal cell, the bacterial cell, the light microscope, and the electron microscope. So now we have looked in what are the different structures found in the cell and what is what are the functions of each of the cell organelles? Now, in order for the cell to survive, the cell need materials. The cell need oxygen. The cell need glucose. The cell needs proteins, enzymes. And on the other hand, the waste products are also produced in the cell. So the cell needs to get rid of them as well. So there need to be the substances to move in and out of the cell, which happens through the cell membrane. But there are two processes that are involved in movement of substances in and out of the cell. So we categorize these two processes in terms of active transport and the passive transport. Now, in order to understand this active transport and passive transport, let's take an example of a hill. So there's a hill and one boy is standing with the ball at the top of the hill and one boy is standing with the ball down. Now, it is easier for the one at the top of the hill to send the ball down and it will not take much of the energy to send the ball down. 
But on the other hand, if you send the ball up, you require more energy because it is going against the gravity. The same thing happened in terms of transport. Whenever the particles move from low to a higher concentration, which means the particle move against the concentration gradient, it requires energy and this is known as active transport. And when the particles move along the concentration gradient, that is from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration without the use of energy, then that is known as passive transport. Now, since the active transport requires energy and we know it is the mitochondria that is responsible for making energies for the cell. So the cells which are involved in active transport have loads of mitochondria and in passive transport, having numerous mitochondria is not a requirement. And the passive transport is of two types, diffusion and osmosis. Now, let us see what is diffusion and what is osmosis. Now, if you see this diagram here, this was an empty container of water and a drop of ink, which was purple in color, was dropped. This ink started to spread out and it spread it out evenly until the particles of the ink are evenly distributed in the water. You can see this with this example. There are more particles on to the left side as compared to the right side. So the particles with time from the left side move towards the right side until the concentration of the particles is equal on both sides. This phenomenon is diffusion. Now, if it comes in the exam, how will you define diffusion? You will say it is a net movement of particles from an area of a higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. It is a passive process, so it does not require energy as the particle moves along the concentration gradient. Now, what are the factors that affects diffusion? Now, the diffusion is dependent on four important factors. One is the surface area. Second is the concentration gradient. Third is the diffusion distance. And fourth is the temperature. Now, greater the surface area, greater is the rate of diffusion of the particle. Because if the surface area is more, the particle will get more room for movement. So all the exchange surfaces have a greater surface area, like the root cells has root hairs and intestine has villi. The greater the concentration gradient in the two regions, greater is the rate of diffusion. So all the exchange surfaces, they, they maintain the steepest concentration gradient. How? The root cells are close to the xylem and villi has rich blood supply that maintains the concentration gradient. Now diffusion distance has to be smaller for the diffusion to take place because the particles, if they travel lesser distance, they will diffuse quickly. So all the exchange surfaces maintain a smaller diffusion distance by being one cell thick. So if you see any of the exchange surface, it will be one cell thick. And last is the temperature. Greater the temperature, greater is the rate of distribution as the particle will get more kinetic energy for movement. So to summarize, I can say that rate of diffusion is surface area times the concentration gradient divided by the diffusion distance. And you need to remember that because if any questions on adaptation of diffusion comes in, you need to talk about all these four factors, how that particular surface is maintaining a higher surface area, greater concentration gradient, smaller diffusion distance and temperature. Now, the diffusion in animals, there are two examples for diffusion in animals. In lungs or the alveoli, there's a diffusion of gases that takes place. And in small intestine, diffusion of digested food takes place. If you see this structure of the alveoli, the lungs have millions of alveoli, which increases the surface area. For the shorter diffusion distance, they are one cell thick. And for maintaining the concentration gradient, they have rich blood supply. On the other hand, the small intestine, the wall is folded to form finger-like projections called the villi. Villi are one cell thick and they have rich blood supply. So if this question comes in the exam, what are the adaptations? You need to talk about all these three factors, how the larger surface area is maintained, how the diffusion distance is maintained, and how the concentration gradient is maintained. Now, another example for diffusion in plants is diffusion of gases to the stomata and diffusions of water and minerals through the stem. So for stomata, it has a greater surface area because it has tiny pores called stomata. For thin diffusion distance, they are one cell thick. And for steep concentration gradient, for dysenthetic cells are close to stomata. For the root hair cells, the roots are project to form the root hair cells. Root hair are one cell thick. And to maintain the concentration gradient, xylem is located close to the root hair cells. 
Okay, so I hope the examples of diffusion in plants and animals along with the adaptation they have for maximum diffusion is clear to you. Now let us look at another special case of diffusion called osmosis. Now why osmosis is a special case? Because there are two special things in osmosis. First, it is the diffusion of only water molecules. Diffusion can be diffusion of any substance, but osmosis is the diffusion of just water molecule. And second, it is a semi-permeable membrane or partially permeable membrane is required. Now, what is a semi-permeable membrane? The membrane that allows only specific molecules to pass through like water. Now, if you see this diagram here, where there is more water. The water is more in the left because there's no solute. On to the right, there are salt molecules, so it has less water. So water from the dilute solution, dilute means has more water, passes through this concentrated solution through this semi-permeable membrane until the water concentration is equal in both cases, and this is known as osmosis. So osmosis is a net movement of water particles from the region of high concentration of water particles to a region of low concentration of water particle across a semi-permeable membrane or you can say it's the movement of water from a dilute solution to a concentrated through a semi-permeable membrane. So I hope this definition of osmosis and this concept that it is the movement just of water molecules to the semi-permeable membrane and it's the movement of water from a dilute to a concentrated solution is clear to you. Always remember, don't write it as a movement of substance from high concentration to low concentration. That's the wrong definition. It is high concentration of water to a low concentration of water is the correct one. Now, let's see what happens, how osmosis in plants takes place. Now, there are generally three kinds of solution. Hypotonic, hypotonic, isotonic. Hyper means more, more solute. So the hypertonic is that solution which has more solute, so less concentration of water. Hypotonic is the solution that has less solute, so more concentration of water. And isotonic is the solution which has same concentration of water in and out. So if we place a plant cell in a hypertonic solution, what happens? The outer solution has less water, so the water from the cell will move out of the plant cell by osmosis. So the plant cell will shrink and it will recede or move away from the cell wall and this is known as plasmolysis. So when a cell is placed in a hypertonic solution, it shrinks and this condition in a plant cell is plasmolysis. On the other hand, when you place it in a hypotonic, that is more concentration of water, the water will move into the plant cell by osmosis. Then the plant cell will increase in size, become swollen. As it becomes swollen, it will give a pressure to the cell wall and the cell membrane. That pressure is known as a turgid pressure or the turgid pressure. And that makes the plant cell in its proper shape. On the other hand, if we place it in an isotonic solution, it will have the same concentration of water outside and inside. So there's no net movement of water. As a result, no pressure will build up and the cell will be soft. So in the plant cell, there are three terms, turgid, plasmolyzed, and flaccid. And you need to remember these terms. Next is in plants. If you place it in a hypertonic solution, that is more concentration of solute, the cell will lose water by osmosis and shrink in size. If you place an isotonic solution, there's no net movement. So the cell remains intact. And in an hypotonic solution, the cell will gain water, so it will swell and it can eventually burst as well with time. Now, the next transport is the active transport. Active transport, as you remember, we did uphill and downhill. So active transport is uphill. That is movement of substances from low concentration to high concentration. That is against the concentration gradient with the use of energy. It is dependent on respiration as it requires energy. So the cell involved in active transport have lots of mitochondria. In plants, where active transport takes place, it takes place in the roots where water and minerals need to be absorbed against the concentration gradient so that maximum water and minerals can enter the plant root. And in animal, at times the digestive food, even after proper diffusion, need to be absorbed more so that the maximum absorption takes place. So their active transport plays a role. And in some of the marine organism that has a lot of concentration of salts develop in their body. So they expel that excess salt 
by the salt glands, which works by active transport. Okay, so I hope the movement of substances in and out of the cell is clear to you. Now we need to do the next thing that we know the cell perform its function, but the cell has to divide. Why the cell needs to divide? For reproduction, growth and repair. Now, how does the cell cycle takes place? This cell cycle is divided into three stages. First is the preparation phase, which is the interface stage. It is the longest phase of the cell cycle in which the cell grows in size and prepares the cell by making all the proteins and the enzyme needed for cell division. And the very important step that takes place in the interface stage is a replication of DNA where the DNA duplicates its content. After this preparation of the interface stage is done, then comes the mitosis stage. Mitosis is a division of the nucleus in which the parent cell splits into two daughter nuclei, which contains exactly the same number of chromosomes as the parent cell, so the daughter cells are genetically identical. And next is cytokinesis. It is a division of the cytoplasm, which takes place after the division of the nucleus. Now, what is mitosis? It is a type of cell division in which a parent nuclei divide to form two daughter nuclei with exactly the same number of chromosomes as that of the parent nuclei the daughter cell produced are genetically identical to the parent and we can call them clones this division is important for growth regeneration and repair and mitosis is also important in asexual reproduction now how the stages of mitosis takes place here is a diagrammatic representation of it we started with although there are 46 chromosomes 23 pairs but for diagram we are using starting with two chromosomes so these two chromosomes first duplicated once they duplicated they lies at the center through these spindle fibers the spindle fiber shrinks and breaks them from the middle so that each end now has two chromosomes copy and then the nucleus divides so we get two daughter nuclei with exactly the same number of chromosomes as the parent nuclei okay so i hope this mitosis is clear to you you should know what are the stages of the cell cycle how the cell divides what is the importance of mitosis and what is the significance of mitosis okay now let us see how the development of a human cell takes place now let us look at how the process of cell specialization takes place now, let me first explain you what is the entire life cycle of a living organism. Now, we have a male parent and a female parent. Now, both male parent and female parents have 23 pairs of chromosomes. This is what you need to remember. We have 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs, from which 23 has come from our mother and 23 from our father. Now, male cell, they undergo another division. We just saw mitosis. There's another division called meiosis, which produces half the number of chromosomes and is required to make the gametes. So the male parent make a sperm or a male gamete and a female parent makes ovum or a female gamete and both has 23 chromosomes. Now during fertilization, they both fuse to form a zygote and this zygote now has 46 chromosomes so that 46 or 23 pairs numbers is restored. Now this zygote divides into two, four, six, eight, and many cell types and forms an embryo. Now at this stage, the entire cell is unspecialized. It has no function. We do not know which part of the cell will form the digestive system, which part of the cell will form the circulatory system. After that, the process of cell differentiation begins. Now this embryo, which cells have not yet specialized, are stem cells. So stem cells are the undifferentiated mass of cell which can differentiate into any cell type. Now after this what happens is the process of cell specialization where the cell becomes specialized to perform specific function. So some part of the cell will get specialized to form the circulatory system, some will specialize to form digestive system and will give rise to a whole new organism. So in plant cell, the majority of the plant cell are the stores of stem cells. The root meristem, shoot meristem are the parts of actively growing part of the cell which contains the stem cells. We can take that and make a new plant. The plant can be grown easily because majority of the parts are not differentiated and the ones which are differentiated, their differentiation is not permanent. So they can be reversed. Okay. Now in animals, majority of the cells are differentiated at a very early stage. In a plant, they get differentiated at a very later stage. 
So as in plants, they are differentiated at a very early stage. They are already specialized to form a nerve cell or a muscle cell. Now, adult cells replace the old and worn out cells in humans, but they also have a limited regeneration and the specialized power. And as majority of the differentiation is permanent, the cloning of the animals is difficult. So this is what is happens in an animal differentiation. And this is what are the plant differentiation. Okay, so now. What are stem cells? So stem cells are the undifferentiated massive cells that can differentiate into any cell type. The sources of the stem cells are embryo, leftover remains of the embryo, umbilical cord. These are the sources of embryonic stem cells and bone marrow is the source of adult stem cells. Now, what is the possible promises of the stem cells? There are a lot of problems in which the transplantation gets failed due to the rejection of the uh, recipient from the donor because the cell recognize it as a foreign and the immune system tries to kill it. But if the stem cells of the person body are used to generate the organ, then the chances of rejection can be solved. Second, there are a lot of neurogenetic degenerative disorder in which the part of the nerve cells get damaged. If the person's stem cells can recreate those nerve cells and the neurodegenerative disease can be treated, the disease like blindness can be treated. It can be a cure of diabetes. If the beta cells of the pancreas get regenerated, it can help in a therapeutic cloning. In a therapeutic cloning, we take the adult stem cells, make it to ma uh, make the embryonic stem cells, and then embryonic stem cells are specialized to make the desired organ. And it can also solve the organ damage problem. So stem cells is a very good promise, very good potential medicine revolution for future. However, there are a lot of issues against the stem cell. As the cells of the stem cells are rapidly dividing, if we introduce the stem cell into an organism, it can lead to cancer. The stem cells can be contaminated and can cause unwanted diseases to the patient. The research in stem cell is still slow and expensive. The research happens on aborted embryos, which is considered as a potential source of life. And many religions have ethical concerns against it. And the knowledge of cell specialization, what genes get switched on and off, on differentiation is still incomplete. Okay, so I hope we have covered this topic in a much detail. And I have tried to cover the maximum of your specification. Now, it's the time to test yourself by seeing if you know these key terms. So what are cells, mitochondria, nucleus, cytoplasm, ribosome, prokaryotic, eukaryotic cell, cell wall, cell membrane, vacuole, microscopes, resolution, magnification, xylem, phloem, diffusion, osmosis, plasmolysis, turgid, flaccid, mitosis, differentiation, stem cell, therapeutic cloning. If you are still not here with these terms, I would recommend you to go back watch the videos and then try over these key terms. So now you can pause the videos and have a go on trying these key terms. Okay, so I hope now you have written these answers on what is the meaning of these key terms. Now let us look at your answers. What are cells? Cell is a basic structural and functional unit of the living organism. Mitochondria is the organelle, which is the site of aerobic respiration. Nucleus is the organelle, which controls the activities of the cell. Cytoplasm is a jelly-like fluid which serves the cell and contain enzymes for chemical reaction. Ribosomes are the cell organelles for the site of protein synthesis. Prokaryotic cells are the primitive cell without nucleus or membrane-bound organelles. Eukaryotic cells are the advanced cell type with nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. Cell walls is the outer layer of the plant cell which provides shape and support to the plant. Cell membrane is the outer layer that controls what goes in and out of the cell. Vacuole is an organ present in the plant cell which has cell sap and makes the cell turgid. Microscope is a device that is used to see the objects which are not visible by the naked eye. Resolution is the ability to distinguish between two closely placed objects. Magnification is the ability to enlarge an object. Xylem is a transporting tissue that transports water and mineral. Phloem transport food, diffusion, movement of substances from higher concentration to lower concentration. Osmosis is the movement of water molecule from a region of high concentration of water to low concentration across a semi-permeable membrane. Plasmolysis is the shrinking of plant cell when placed in a hypertonic solution. 
Turgid is a fully swollen cell which has gained water by osmosis. Flaccid is a soft cell due to no net movement of water. Mitosis is cell division that produces identical daughter cell. Differentiation is cell specialization. Stem cell is an undifferentiated massive cell that specialized to any cell type. And therapeutic cloning is using adult cell to produce embryonic stem cells and differentiating them to produce a required cell type. So I hope now you are well clear with this topic. Now what you need to do next is check the specification, make sure the specification is clear to you, and then you need to do the exam question on this topic. If there's still anything that you do not understand, leave a comment below and we'll reply you as soon as possible. Or you can come to our website where we have set up a 24 seven chat support till your exam. You can come anytime, ask any questions and you can get instant reply. If if you like this video then do subscribe to our channel and do not forget to like comment and share this video if there's any specific topic you want me to make the next video on then also do leave a comment below and i'll make sure i put that up before your exam okay so i'll see you next in the next video of the next section till then happy revising